I'm looking right now at a, a, a series of snapshots that was taken on a very special day. It was taken on March 1st, 1968, which happened to be the eve of the marriage of a young cat, couple by the name of Bill and Catherine. And uh, we were also once at Hell, but at Chateau Blas. <laughs> a very special evening for a very special place. And w I've been trying to think of the one word that would, uh, would uh, wrap up uh, um, Chateau Blas. And I say it was ph phenomena. And um, I mean, if you have probably had a computer model uh, of it, it probably wouldn't work. <laughs> but it happened to be an immediate success. A sensational success, not only for Hamiltonians, which we could imagine, but also from many out-of-towners, people going to the shore and going back. And you would meet people, oh, I know, Chateau Blas. For Angela's father, Frank, after years of hard work, it was a hymn, the, the fulfilling of the American dream. And for um, it to work, that it had all the, the pieces had to fit. And so we're fortunate tonight to have Angela here to give us the history of it and how all those pieces fit and how the recipe worked to make it such a grand success. So I give you Angela. This is turned on, right? Can you hear me? Thank you for inviting me to speak, first of all. And uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And you can see there are a lot of things up here in front that maybe you'll get a chance to look at if you haven't already. And uh, one of the big pictures in the center is of Bill's um, uh, rehearsal dinner. I did that because I wanted people to get the flavor of the dining room, and that's why I have some uh, dishes. I don't have the dishes, excuse me. I do have some dishes, like those glass dishes that are there. Uh, the small one was a salad for two or spaghetti for two. The bigger one was salad for four or spaghetti for four. And uh, that is some of the silver. It was hotel plate. Um, so you had to use a special dip to put it in before you put it through the dishwasher. And so those are some of the things. That's one of the original um, centerpieces, which was changed already in 68 when, Bill, um, when Bill's um, rehearsal dinner was done. And some of the other pictures are of early ones of my dad and his brothers when they owned, um, they were all butchers. And of my mom, who was basically a bookkeeper. And then the pictures, the newer pictures of my mom and dad were taken um, when they were at the chateau. Um, they were actually taken right after my dad had been diagnosed with cancer and I kind of talked him into getting a picture done. Uh, before his hair fell out, I told him. So um, they took that. There was one of them together, so there would have been one picture, but she didn't have as nice a smile, and he didn't look as good either, so you have two pictures. So that's what they actually look like, um, actually right near the end, because um, he did die in 1972. Um, on the end are some... Um, newspapers. Uh, Grace, everyone's friend, Grace yeah. Patera, did two articles on the Chateau. I'll quote a little bit from them, but those are the full articles. And I um, thought you might enjoy, if I read it, it'll sound like Grace saying it, because she interviewed my mom and I was there, but that was kind of way after the fact, you know, and so a few of the things are a little off. Neither one of us remembered it correctly. But I also have a letter that I wrote, <clears throat> one of my famous letters, my kids will tell you, um, kind of long, but somebody that um, was unhappy with the Chateau, and that was in 1967. But it has so much history in it, and that's why I'm going to do that. So, to start with, oh, and the Blue Willow, Old Blue Willow dish 
is there because that was in a closet at the old chateau and there were some old dishes there and when we made the new dining room we used blue willow and that was partially the reason and i guess also because my mom when i was young had a blue set of blue willow so we used to have some big blue willow mugs and that's what the gravy was served on at your table uh if you if you ordered more than one otherwise you got a little tiny you got Everybody got extra sauce. One of the neat things was that um, you didn't get it the way you get it in most places today, your spaghetti. My mom always, it was already mixed with the sauce and when it came out. And then you got extra sauce besides. <laughs> so I, I think that's something a little different. Okay, so I, I'm trying, I have to read some of these things because I'll be all over the place if I don't. And I'm naming this the butcher and the bookkeeper. <laughs> My father, Frank Belazzo, worked for Ruberton's Market before he was married. Mrs. Ruberton was a colliserta, as was Mrs. Belazzo, my dad's mom. Later, the Belazzo brothers took over Ruberton's Market and it became the Belazzo Brothers Market. And I found a uh, a clipping that my mom had saved showing the three brothers. It was my father, my uncle Rocky Belazzo, and my uncle Gerard Belazzo. Um, I don't know how long it lasted, but when he was married in 1937, he was a butcher at a Livos market. So apparently it didn't work. <laughs> Later they took air over the store next to Bellevue Drug. It was a uh, it's a parking lot now, and um, was also called Belazzo Brothers, and we lived upstairs. This probably didn't last too long because my dad was trying to add a liquor license to the butcher shop and grocery store, and uh, he was turned down. So he bought a place in Atco. In 1941, we moved to Atco and um, had a house and a store, and there was a bar attached. But ACO wouldn't let him have the license either. So that was another disappointment. We were there until 1953 when we returned to Hamilton so my mom could care for her mother. My dad commuted till 1955, and at that point the store pretty much failed. He was 48 years old. My mother, Ida Felciani, worked at Hamilton Building Material Company from before her graduation in 1929. When she was 15 or 16, her father sent her to Ruber Rice to learn how to, to learn bookkeeping. And she did bookkeeping for the grocery butcher shop next to the Bellevue Drug at the store in Atco, where at one point she was also Waterford Township town treasurer. Then she did the books for the Fairview Hotel in the Chateau Belaz. She worked in the bookkeeping department of First Federal, and later years was the bookkeeper for the gift shop at Kessler Hospital. Bookkeeping was her thing. My mom and dad never took vacations, but their pleasure was going to restaurants and occasional weekend in New York City. When I was growing up, Atco had two wonderful white tablecloth restaurants with waiters and busboys, Larry's Inn and The White Way. Farther down were Tips Inn and Dumbarton Oaks. The owners bought from my dad's store, so they were friends too. This was the background they had when they reopened the Fairview Hotel at Chateau Belaz. They knew how they wanted things to look, how they wanted the food to be served, and the atmosphere they wanted to create. The idea was to feel like you were having dinner at my grandfather's house, leisurely, from soup to nuts, which was sometimes, they did serve nuts sometimes at the end of a meal. <laughs> Two hours were allotted between reservations the tables were large, 42 by 42 inches. I think later they might have been cut down a little because we're running out of space. And the food was at first served almost totally family style. 
But that changes because that jarred my mother because she had to start making stuff flounder and lobster tails and you know how it goes when you're out. Who wants this? Who wants that? In the little restaurant they were used to serving, people came in and everybody ordered the same thing. So it came out on big platters and whatever. So it lost a little bit of that, but they, they tried to keep it by using those bigger bowls. Gravy was made every day in large pots, but a small pot was kept heated so the taste was always consistent. The produce came from Gino's, the meat came from Balazzo's Market, Dad's brother Rocky, and in Ferreira's Market. The bread came from Ideal Bakery, the tables and chairs came from A&C Furniture, the flowers were from Warner's Florist. My mom was a wonderful cook, much like her mom. She would take her time and make sure everything was watched and cared for properly. She was not used to cooking for large groups. Selma Petters did all the baking, along with many other things in the kitchen and sometimes in the dining room, especially when they served lunches. And I think she may have worked for them before the dining room was made bigger, but I'm not sure about that. And of course, most of you remember Selma. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so this lady, I don't, I'm sure the letter is somewhere in my junk, but this was the answer. My mom wasn't happy with this letter, so what I said, too much information. But my father, he didn't care, so he let me, he let me mail it. Sometimes in 1967, so you know they opened in about 65, so things were not smoothed out. Dear Mrs. Jensen, your letter was very much appreciated and I wish we could say all the wrongs will be righted immediately. We've been wrestling with all these problems you mentioned for over two years and still haven't come up with a workable solution. We're in the process of planning the enlargement of the kitchen and are looking for a professional cook or chef, but it is mostly a matter of taking two steps forward and three backward. Perhaps some background will give you insight into the problem. Fate played an unusual role in the growth of the chateau. As a daughter of Frank and Ida, I have been in a position of watching it turn into an overnight success that we couldn't control and were ill-equipped to handle. My dad and mom were hard workers, and they always have been, but all their hard work never brought success until now. So hard work isn't the answer. My dad acquired the Chateau 12 years ago when it was known as Champagne Charlie's. It was scheduled to be torn down for a gas station. His brother-in-law, M.L. Ruberton, who was also his cousin, and John McKeezy owned the property. At that time, he was 48 years old and had closed his grocery butcher shop in Atco because it had failed. Since he was out of a job, he asked if he could run the business. My dad always had been a dreamer, but his dreams always seemed to hit stone walls. It was an old, dilapidated white elephant. My dad would die every time a woman entered the place. It was that bad. As time passed, he managed to remodel the bar area and paint the rest of the place. The dining room was quite small, only holding three tables. The kitchen was unbelievable. My dad, a little old lady, Petey, whose picture is over there, um, <clears throat> who came with the business, and my mom at night, she worked in the savings loan all day, ran the place. The food was fabulous and the clientele was small, came from all over, mostly in very big cars. My dad would look outside at Caddy's and Lincoln's, and then at his old dining room, cracked walls and all, and shake his head in disbelief. Not long after the bar was remodeled, a car drove into the side of the building and ruined much of it. It was early in the morning and thank God no one was hurt. After fixing the damage, nine months passed and the same thing happened again. No one was hurt again, but this time my dad and customers were in the bar. The dining room was also damaged and customers had just left. That was too close for comfort. There are pictures over on the end of that last accident. There are about five pictures showing the crash. We spent months in indecision. We were afraid to allow people to eat 
in the dining room. We decided the answer was to move the dining room to the other side of the building. I begged, I pleaded, I coaxed, because they were afraid of going into debt at their age. They knew they were making a living the way things were, but they were afraid of the unknown. We tried to design an attractive dining room and exterior and do what we could at that time for the kitchen. We did as much as we could with the money available. My mom wanted a home dishwasher and couldn't see why we needed a 30 cup coffee pot. We had managed all this time with an eight cup dripolator. But my dad and I, we had big plans. We envisioned at least 20 people a night for dinner. So we insisted on a small secondhand commercial dishwasher and a 30 cup coffee maker. On May 31st, 1965, we opened the new dining room. It was unbelievable what happened. The food and the service was the same as it was in the tiny dining room. The meat was fresh cut as the orders came in by my dad, who had spent all his life as a butcher. Sauces, meat, and vegetables were prepared by mom and Petey, the little lady I mentioned, in the only way they knew, with love, the way my grandmother did it. Salad prepared fresh to my dad's specifications, although it was Petey's recipe originally, but added to by my dad. Drinks were mixed with nothing sparing. Fresh squeezed lemons and oranges for whiskey sours that gained quite a following. There was no menu at this time. I was a waitress with no experience, but I served the food with love and a flourish that I learned from my dad. My husband and I and my aunt mingled with the guests as if they were guests in our home. Within a short time, word of mouth spread news of the chateau. Things got all out of proportion, and we can't seem to find any answers. We do not want to go to a steam table kitchen. We do not want to do anything that will damage the taste of the food or drinks. I guess that was a period, missed it. <laughs> the restaurant supply house can't seem to help us. We are too involved to go to school. We know we need help because the service is hurting badly. We still have many guests who know they have to wait and are willing, but we want everyone to be happy. We're hoping that a new kitchen will help. I'm going to try and spend more time there to see if it will help. Our first child was born June 3rd, 1966, after seven, six years of marriage, seven years of marriage, and I would drew myself completely from the business. This didn't help my parents. My aunt has purchased the business she worked in for 35 years, so she hasn't been able to devote the time she used to that brought the personal touch to the chateau. My husband has his own family business to take care of, so he doesn't have the time, although any chance he gets, he helps. Most businesses of this type have children who are part of them. We have a problem. I'm an only child. To make matters worse, Petey died before I had my child. We're not making excuses. We feel very badly when anyone is unhappy with us. It's like a guest was not happy in your own home. We wouldn't blame you if you never returned. When my dad said to you, what can I do? It was a question he meant. We never expected the Chateau to handle the amount of people it does. I said we were dreamers. Well, this was so far beyond our wildest dreams it is almost a nightmare. We need a good hostess, as you notice. The fact that other people were seated before you can be explained as they had reservations. The salad does not take that long to make, but my mom will not allow it to go out until she's able to work on your food order. She tries to be careful that the soup and salad do not arrive at once. I'm afraid the blame for that is on the rush of the day. The TV is on in that room because it was the living room in 1965, as the chateau is my parents' home. It was on because a regular male customer who dines alone enjoys watching it as he eats. 
It should have been turned off after he left. This is another place where a good hostess is needed. We're doing the best we can with what we have to work with and the experience we have, but we are not doing the best that can be done. We hope to rectify this in the very near future. Thank you for your letter. P.S. It is still very hard for mom and dad to understand what happened to them. Not many people in this world have their dreams come true so late in life. It is still very hard for us, the younger generation, to get through to them that more money has to be spent in order for the chateau to go on and in order for our guests to be as happy and content as those guests were in our little dilapidated dining room. So I, I guess you can hear from that some of the ladies' problems. Um, and she was right. So the kitchen was enlarged. Eventually enough bartenders, waitresses, busboys, and a hostess were hired. Some coming from Sinelli's Country House in Cherry Hill, which I'm sure some of you remember. They were moonlighting, I think. They were still working there. <laughs> they never did hire a chef, but they did have many capable people in the kitchen. They did at one point get an efficiency expert to help with streamlining different parts of the business. And, that's about, and that was, so the letter was from 1967. So, uh, Grace's of column was a course written in retrospect. So I mean, I'm just not sure if I wanna, I think I'll, all right, I have a couple of, they're over there, these um, reviews from, this one was from the Inquirer and um, Chateau with an Italian flavor. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I have some things underlined. Uh, we approached the Chateau Belaz. The name intrigued. It suggested France, Spain, and perhaps Hungary. Um, after entering through the commodious and busy bar, we were seated in the smallish dining room with an even smaller room attached. One quick let look at the menu and all thoughts of France, Spain, or Hungary fled. The food is unequivocally Italian, running the gamut from pasta fagiole to spumoni. The menu assured us everything including the pasta is cooked to order and patience is required, is requested. This is good advice. Although the service at Chateau Belaz is courteous and fairly expert, speed is not one of its virtues. Now this was in 1969 also. Uh, top quality rib steak, 450. Cooked to perfection and free of all sauces and other, I don't know what this word is, whatever, extras I guess, was our other selection. With it came homemade ravioli with a quite fine tomato sauce and lashings of fresh ground parmesan. Um, and that was from the Enquirer in 1969. Philadelphia Magazine had something, Chateau Belaz. Um, Mrs. Belazzo cooks her sauces with lots of TLC. Um, dishes up tasty salads full of cheese and olives and anchovies and uses the finest baby veal. My father didn't get any credit for this. Only my mother, that's good. You know, we did promise my mother when we were adding on to this dining room Oh, you can be the hostess. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> it was, that was a dirty trick. No. <laughs> you met. You managed to overlook the incongruity of stuffing away all this fine cuisine in a fo forest of toll lamps and maple that decorates this early American style chateau. So he didn't like my decorations too much. <laughs> um, when I read you Grace's, you'll see Grace loved it. <laughs> the bar and wine cellar are outstanding. Generous drinks at fair prices. Every Italian wine you can want and reasonable selection of American and French ones thrown in for good measure. Um, this one in 69, I didn't read that part. He didn't like the wine, so he didn't think we had too much wine. So by 1971, things must have been looking up. 
Complete dinners here go for about $6, including nibbles of a zesty provolone and olives, salad, spaghetti or linguine, choice of veal fromage, steak or sausage, meatballs and veal, all accompanied by a generous portion of sauteed mushrooms and peppers and topped off by dessert. So that was, and this is from the Courier Post on February 12th, 1972. I find this interesting because my second son was born two days before this. But like I said, I really didn't have much to do with the own day-to-day -day, um, running of the business. What would you say to having a dis oh, I didn't want to read that part. Chateau Balaz and this, because this guy, Alonzo Gristle, writes like a story. So, what would you say to having a decent meal under your belt before we set out? So, they're going there for dinner. Chateau Balaz, a Hamilton eatery specializing in Italian cooking. I tell you, we were indeed fortunate to make our appearance at the Chateau on a weekday evening when reservations, though recommended, were not an absolute prerequisite. Our tale would be different if it had been on a Saturday night for which a week's notice is generally required for seating. At most, the dining room accommodates only 60 persons. I opted for the works, choosing a boneless prime rib as a main course, and I selected the Chateau Veal Fromage. The works began with a cocktail snack and four black olives, six bites of provolone on a small white plate. This was followed, however, by a truly first-rate salad of lettuce, anchovies, pimento slices, laced with an excellent spicy Italian dressing. Things really got rolling with the next course. Homemade spaghetti served separately with a separate tomato sauce. Enough was provided for each of us to fill our bowls twice. And I would have been perfectly contented to stop there, but the main course was on its way. The veal fromage consisted of a tender steak topped by mild melted cheese and more tomato sauce. It was quite adequate. Maxwell said his prime rib about the only concession to standard fare on the otherwise strictly Italian menu was out of sight. It came garnished with a colorful mixture of mushrooms, pimentos, and green peppers. For dessert, I had something called carrot cake. 1972, carrot cake was kind of an unknown. And Selma, that was her secret recipe, which tasted not at all like carrots, as I had feared, but more like a fruit cake with a subtle hint of ginger. So in December of 72, this same writer in the Courier Post picks out restaurants, um, 14 restaurants, from what he had done the whole year. And the Chateau Velaz happened to be one of them. Um, Whitehorse Pike, Hamilton, provincial, but food strictly Italian is an absolute knockout, especially the spaghetti dishes, entirely homemade. That's not exactly true. I mean, they use, they, he, they use a lot of imported um, spaghetti. Uh, they, they did have homemade, and uh, which I forgot to mention, the homemade macaroni and the raviolis were made by, uh, I don't know if you remember, Rocky's Ravioli, the Tomasetti family. So that's where they, that came from. Um, so anyway, out of all the, the whole year, he picked out 14 and that was one of them. <coughs> I think I, that's all of those, those things. Um, I found my mom's, I guess in 72, I, she knew they were leaving there, because they did leave in April of uh, 72. And she wrote down some of her recipes. So they're kind of in this book. If anybody's interested in seeing them, I forget where, but they're somewhere in this book and a lot of phone numbers. Um, so how do we come up with a design and whatever? Um, it's interesting. My dad had a concept of what he wanted to do with the outside. And um, so I'll just show you. I did the specs and the drawings 
and dealt with the carpenter, and so did he. We kind of worked on it together. But one of the first concepts was going to be this way. It was almost the same, except it had a squared off roof and a kind of a fancy awning or whatever. This is what I call a better homes and gardens renovation because now that I'm historic preservation minded and you look at the old picture, it was not too nice what we did to that building. But uh, better homes and gardens had this thing about, you know, you did away with all the dormers, which there were, if you look at the old picture, it's all the way over on the right. Um, the dormers are gone and you, paint the top all gray so you can't see it. And so the bottom did stand out and possibly, I don't know if that's why all these people stopped there that, that first um, time. I thought I had the other one here too, which showed, well anyway, I guess I don't. But I, there's another picture that shows the front and the sides of the way it, it kind of did get made. The inside, um, kind of came from a picture like this. Oh, here's that other one. Just out of a magazine with the blue. And we did have some black chairs. We had a black rocker just like that in our, in our uh, living room, which was right next door, which we closed with uh, bifold doors. So it could be used for a dining room. And then it did eventually become a dining room. Oh, this is the other picture. It's, this is kind of more like what it looked like and it's new. These are my drawings. I fancy myself an architect. <laughs> I fancy myself a lot of things. So did my father. So I take after him. My mother thought we were all a little crazy. <laughs> and we were. Um, this is my drawing of the dining room. Um, which is kind of... And, I think we were going to use check tablecloths, blue and white, um, but then we ended up with a kind of a pale blue tablecloth. And I can remember Tootie Rice asking me one day, how'd you come up with that color scheme? <laughs> and of course we had a red carpet, and that's where my dad's ad came from when he first opened. Uh, you get the red carpet treatment. And on this one over here, there's a picture of the bar when he first remodeled it. Can you get that picture, Kelly? And on the back of this card, it says it's what's inside that counts, because the outside still looked like the old building. And um, before he added restrooms, there was only a men's room downstairs. They used our bathroom upstairs. So. He finally added two bathrooms, and then that's how the dining room got to be the size that it was. Um, because what we did is we added about five or six feet for an entryway and just uh, squared off the building. And that's how it became the size that it was. Squared off the square building. Not, kitchen was an addition in the back. And then when they added to the kitchen, they added, went behind the kitchen and co covered in another area on the side for uh, storage and where he used to cut the meat. And that's how the chateau ended up the size it ended up. They did end up with tables in the bar at one point. Uh, I think it was a big square table and a couple of, a couple of tables for two. And the second um, fixing of the bar, it was, it was a little more elegant and um, new stools and new back, and all new drapes everywhere, which uh, maybe somebody could tell me what that word is, because I can't say it. You know, the French print toil or toile. I never can pronounce it correctly. OK. Uh, one of his customers had a custom make, made making uh, drapery business, and they were regular customers. And so they put the new draperies up. And they were blue and white, and that was in the bar and in the dining room with white uh, sheer curtains. The first ones came from <clears throat> probably Grant's. <laughs> um, blue, blue on each side and white um, fiberglass curtains in the middle. And then somewhere along the line, uh, I noticed in Bill's pictures, they look like they're red. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that happened, and I don't remember seeing any red curtains. So 
I did find the picture of my son Frank's um, christening. They're blue, and that's the ones I remember. And then they went to this, uh, the other really nice looking grapes. Um, the little dining room that where our, our living room was, was then done with um, black um, captain's chairs. There were smaller tables for four, I believe. And I think there may have been four of them in there. So they just kept trying to squeeze more people in. Um, it was a little too much for them a lot of times, and so they ended up closing on Mondays and Tuesdays. There was a point where they um, had lunches, and people liked their lunches. When the Chateau Balaz was um, the little dining room, the guys from the brewery, it was almost their clubhouse. Mm. They were there a lot. And they would have this big, they would almost have dinners for lunch. And that's how, that's the way they were used to serving there with, you know, the big platters, as I said. And uh, I remember one of their friends, or I don't know if he came through the brewery or what, but uh, anybody know Ed Pizak, the guy that had the, the fish, uh, Mrs. Paul's? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. I can remember my husband once had to deliver a whole bunch of champagne up to his house in Pennsylvania for his daughter's wedding, I think. So he was a good friend and used to stop, be there a lot too. And that's how the champagne thing came about. I mean, a lot of people drank a lot of champagne there. <laughs> and um, I, I think I'll just read some of Grace's because I think she mentions that in here. There once stood a popular and prosperous restaurant here in Hamilton at the corner of Fairview Avenue and Whitehorse Pike where Wawa now stands. At, its, at first its name, Chateau Balaz, seems to be an unusual coupling. Once inside, however, anyone could see that this was no run-of-the-mill establishment. So the owners were quite right in their assumption that an ordinary name simply would not do. Upon entering the warm ambiance suggested that of the left banks of Paris, or more appropriately, the Italian Riviera, owner Frank Balazzo always greeted his customers dressed in a white shirt, dark trousers, and a bow tie. His neatly manicured mustache enhanced his cosmopolitan appearance, to which a goatee was later added. Soft background music completed the international flavor. Diners instinctively spoke in lowered voices in response to the atmosphere filling the room. It was in this modest area where the patrons savored the most gourmet and tasty cuisine whipped up by the cooks in the kitchen, which incidentally was positioned in back of the dining room. That space was mastered by Frank's wife, co-owner and chief chef, Ida Balazza. And she interviewed my mom in um, the living room, and the facts as I knew them were laced with much misconception and erroneous data concerning the restaurant's history. But this meticulous lady sat comfortably in an oversized easy chair and squared off to set the record straight. It's a complicated odyssey, but one could see by her expression that she relished the chance to look back to the work which fully preoccupied her days for just seven years of her life. Together, this couple achieved in less than a decade what it takes other families, generations, to attain. It all began after they left ACCO in 1952. Very soon in 1955, at age 48, his life would take a turn he so eagerly sought. And I already told you about uh, ML and John McKeezy uh, owning the property. They were going to put a gas station there, and that never materialized. Petey the cook had worked there for years, and the owner's estate would only sell to the buyer who would guarantee that Petey's job was secure. Petey was like, she was the bartender, the cook, the cleaning lady. Especially in the morning, she'd get up really early, and then the farmers would start coming in, and she'd be mopping the floor and serving the farmers at the same time. And um, she was really, 
I talk about her as being a little old lady. Well, I want you to know she died at 72, and that's how old I am. So I don't want anybody calling me a little old lady. But it's, it's really something how things change. Um, weighing heavily on Blasso's belief, weighing he heavily on Blasso's belief that it was what's inside that counts, and Petey's legendary salad, the men trudged on with Frank assuming the role as a hands-on associate and I to keeping the books. Hamiltonians who had not previously <coughs> frequented this location joined the regulars and began to routinely venture in for a good home-cooked meal. Now this was when, they're t she's talking about when the restaurant, before it was remodeled. Over the years, due to the increasing highway traffic flow, two accidents occur, resulting in cars actually slamming into the building. At this point, the Fairview Hotel's name was formally being changed to Chateau Balaz, and why not? It had long been taking on characteristics which were solely Balazzo's design anyway. While the Balazzo's were expanding, they were also focusing their attention on interior design. A separate dining room was added, accentuated in muted country red and blue colors, brimming with warmth and charm. The rechristened Chateau Balaz opened its doors Memorial Day weekend, 1965. The owners and their employees were not prepared for what was about to unfold. It was destined to become a well-known, often written up quality restaurant up there with the best of them. The facade, of the refurbished building was brighter, friendlier, and a true source of welcome. The Chateau Balaz name was scrawled in simple script across the front exterior wall. It simply could not be missed. People streamed in from everywhere on the opening day of 1960, I think it was 65. The kitchen literally ran out of food. The cooks resorted to cheese omelets and the portions of fish which had been reserved for the family's dinner had also been served. Mrs. Balazza remembers many diners feasted on aglio olio, which we locals recognize as pasta with olive oil and garlic. Those were the busiest years of my life, she commented. commented. I had to quit my job at First Federal Savings and Loan to help out there. In order to ease the waiting lines, the Balazzo's instituted a reservation system. It worked, sort of. <laughs> Soon it was commonly known that in order to get a Saturday night reservation, arrangements had to be made at least a week in advance. The owners closed the restaurant on Mondays and Tuesdays because they were still not able to keep up with the public's demand and badly in need of rest. <laughs> Their next attempt to remedy the problem was to close the chateau for lunches and concentrate on the dinner hours. We were turning away twice as many persons as it could fit in the dining room, Ida remembered. It comfortably accommodated 45 patrons, could squeeze up to 60 people, which was most often the case. Now this might give off the sounds of a fishtail by today's measure but some background information on the Chateau's attempts to deal with their popularity explosion might explain the situation. The Blazos already employed six people in the kitchen. One person was constantly busy setting up salads while Blazo, a butcher by trade, cut the meat such as veal or beef as the orders came in. Only fresh would do, and even though they might not be aware of the reason, the people could taste the difference. For all practical purposes, the kitchen could hold no more help, even after its expansion, and the Balazas refused to compromise the integrity of their food. If they were to hold on to their impeccable reputation as the best dining experience anywhere in the area, the customers would simply have to be patient. And so, as time proved to be, as time proved, the patrons did, in fact, remain, as well as as stringently devoted. The thing I was proudest of, I'm sorry, Gabe, <laughs> was that we never spent a penny on advertisement. Well, there is one ad there, but that's when they first opened. Uh, in spite of the revelation, <laughs> I know. What can I tell you? It was written in your paper. <laughs> um, the thing I was proud of, oh, they always said it. <laughs> 
Everyone still knew them well, as it is as in the case of many. In spite of that revelation, everyone still knew them well, and as is the case with many entrepreneurs, they were sometimes recognized while frequenting the most unlikely places. On a trip to Puerto Rico, a family of patrons dashed up to the Blazos expressing genuine surprise to see them in their, out of their familiar roles at the restaurant. They finally did take a vacation. Many notables has routinely sat at the bar unrecognized and able to thoroughly enjoy their chateau encounters. This is kind of how it got its name. Al Black, a past Atlantic City sheriff turned private investigator, still frequented, but the bar clientele was becoming younger and upscale. It was interesting to learn that back then, in a playful move of marketing, rental winery produced an additional chateau champagne sporting vanity labels. Frank's label read Chateau Blas. Al and Frank, Frank would routinely enjoy a drink of this champagne from its personalized bottle. During one of these early encounters, Al chose the nickname Chateau, taken from the label, for Frank. And at the time, and as time would prove, it stuck. It follows then that the restaurant would inherit its name as a result of a natural sequence. Finally, I just needed to know the Chateau salad had become legendary. Many times my husband would pick up ours and take out order by calling at the back door of the kitchen and the direct mission to snoop and learn what secret ingredient added to render it so addictive. Um, Dan could catch a glimpse of a gigantic Bertoli olive oil and white horse vinegar containers, and after trying those condiments, my homegrown concoction still did not taste anything at all like Balazzo's. I scoured lists of herbs and spices, testing several as possible candidates for that one addictive additive which catapulted the Chateau salad to the top of the charts. What was that secret ingredient? At the conclusion of our interview, I bit the bullet. Nervously, I asked Mrs. Balazzo the dreaded question. Would it be possible for you to give me your, the recipe for your salad dressing now that you have been out of the business for so many years? She looked at me with a puzzled look, thinking she did not understand the question. I attempted to clarify my request. Exactly what was your secret ingredient that gave it the unique taste I have never found anywhere else? Accent she answered. As impossible as it may seem, I was speechless. I had no idea what she was talking about. Accent, I asked in disbelief. Yes, she casually asked, answered. I added accent to everything. I bought it in 25 pound lots. So there you have it. The secret of the century has been divulged and you read it here in the Hamilton Gazette. In their simplicity, to want to serve the purest of food to their devoted patrons, the Belazos had created an aura of restaurant folklore. The Belazos sincerely viewed the Chateau Belazos home, hospitality, comfort, and a chance to serve good friends, an excellent home cooked meal. I truly miss the Chateau days. Neither the atmosphere, which reflected the Belazos philosophy, nor their food has ever been equaled in our area since they closed their doors so many years ago. But somehow their contribution is still remembered with great affection, mouths watering at the, mention, at the mere mention of the Chateau. So she was talking to Joe Tramontana at Capitol Bagels, she said, and she mentioned she was working on a piece about the Chateau. Instantly, Joe's face brightened, answering as I was stepping into my car, ah, the chateau. Then quickly adding, his voice trailing off as he was obviously recalling some memorable time spent there. What a great place. So I guess that's it. Um, question. How did your father manage to handle the bar and then go back and cut the meat? Yeah. That's, uh, I know he washed his hands in between. <laughs> and he was always dressed in that white shirt and that bow tie and cutting the meat back there. But 
he did that in the beginning, you know, but then later they did have bartenders. Um, one of the first ones he had was um, Anthony Help. Dino Pucucci. Dino Pucucci, right, was his first, one of his first bartenders. Then he had a couple bartenders from Sinelli's. And years ago, when he had the old chateau, Jimmy Garrison was a bartender for him, too, in between. But, uh, so mostly when he had those bartenders, he didn't tend as much bar as mingling with uh, people in the, in the dining room. Uh, another question, what, what is Petey's last name? Isabella T. Mayo. <coughs> she was an Irish woman, but she married a um, Italian. But they, he died many years ago. She didn't have any children, and uh, she came with the business. But her, it was her sister who was there first, and her sister went away on vacation. Petey came <coughs> to take over to help out Champagne uh, Charlie, Tally. I don't know if the sister was Charlie's girlfriend or not, or something. I don't have this on. I'm not talking it. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Um, but um, she went on vacation and she never came back. So Petey got left there. And um, she was just great. Great old, great young lady. lady. I want to say old lady again until I realized I happened to find the, the card and it said 70s. I said, oh man. That's just not right, calling her a little old lady. Um, I know there's uh, Tony McCree back there, uh, used to be a busboy, and um, where is um, Nick Domenico? Did he leave? Oh, Nick Domenico used to be a dishwasher in the back, so he probably knows some kitchen stories that I don't know about. And way in the back there is Dolores, um, she was a Sasada, Chapin. And Dolores was the hostess that we finally hired. The other one I talked, my, my Aunt Juliet was hostess for a while, for quite a while too, in between. So I don't know if they want to add anything or if anybody. I was um, a freshman in college in 1971, and my my family, the McCree family, lived right across the street next to Tomatello's Winery. And uh, my, uh, they were good friends with your mom and dad. And I guess my aunt one day said, would you like a job as a busboy at Chateau Bellas? And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> so uh, I worked, it was like a Sunday, maybe, maybe going in at 12 noon on a Sunday, and I think maybe a Wednesday night. Because uh, I couldn't do it too much, because like I said, I was in college. But honestly, <coughs> You can't believe it. I can remember the ravioli. I love ravioli even to this day. And they had they had the absolute best, and I mean this sincerely, the best ravioli. I'll tell you what used to happen. Being a busboy, we come in there, and I got to know some of the cooks. These little, I hate to say, it, these little old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They felt like your aunts. You got the, you got it was, it was a family affair. It really was. Yeah. And. I don't know how it started, but I would come in with glasses, and, and they knew I liked raviolis. So if someone ordered ravioli, one of these cute little old ladies in the back corner, am I right? In the back corner, they'd be like, so I'm like, I, I rush over there, and they put like three or four raviolis on the plate. So I'm like, I'm like oh my god, what am I going to do with these? Because the place is busy. You just couldn't stand there and eat raviolis. I'll never forget, it's a God's honest truth story. Whoever this little, it might have been Petey, I don't know. No, Petey was probably gone by then. Yeah, she died okay. uh, before Frank was born, which was in 1966. Okay. So. But get a load of this. They used to put these, and I said, well, what, what am I doing? She said, go sit in the bathroom and eat them. And <laughs> 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 I look in the bathroom, am I right? And I go in there and I close the door and I put the toilet seat down, the, the top part, you know. And I feel like, I feel like eating these red yogis. And, you know, like an hour or two go by, we were busy. We were, the, place was, the place was humming, I'm not exaggerating. And maybe an hour or two would go by, and I'd walk in again, I'd be bringing classes, getting stuff. And I'm done. So, I go back there again, put two or three red on the plate. I was real thin, too. So, uh, 
I go back and I get the raviolis, and once again, I go in the bathroom, and I'm like, this is wrong, but I'm loving the raviolis. So, they must have thought, this guy's got problems. <laughs> Three or four times. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. I don't want to hog up a lot of time, but I'll tell you what, I love that place. I really do. I was a young kid, so I was impressionable. Right. And uh, I'll tell you what else they had. <laughs> they had Pepperidge Farm cakes. The kind they were square. Yeah, they were the birthday up, cakes that yeah, when yeah. people would have a birthday. You open up the freezer, <laughs> and you have all these cakes. <laughs> Vanilla cakes, yellow cake or chocolate, chocolate cake. So what would happen is, you know, we all got, we were working together as one big family. And the waitresses would, they, they, maybe somebody would order cake and they'd cut a couple slices. And there'd be maybe one or two slices left behind, you know, just sitting there. So I can walk in there with glasses and stuff, the waitress says, want a piece of cake that's left over? I'm like, yeah, what am I going to go with this cake? Oh, that's just for you to rob you over. I'm like, I'll tell you what else they had. I spent probably four, four times during my shift in the bathroom. And here's what's sad, at the end of the night, at the end of the night, God, God rest Mrs. Bellazzo, at the end of the night, it would, be, it would usually it would be two busboys, me and another guy. At the very end of the night, after everybody left, they would give you dinner. So Mrs. Bellazzo would be like, Come on, Anthony, come on, get something to eat. And of course, I'd eat again, she only knew. <laughs> I, I thought to myself, Mrs. Balazzo, if you only knew how much stuff I ate, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. And I'll tell you what they had, hold on. Uh, <laughs> I'm going too much, I'm going to They had, they had this little thing, it was like, it was like a vacuum cleaner, for crumbs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's up there. Yeah. It's over there. Yeah. I have to go up there and touch that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what I did. I get it, and I, you know, the, the waitress said, get the crumbs on my table. So I'd be like this. I said, this is a pretty neat little thing. Yeah. And then the waitress would watch it. There's no more crumbs on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way this thing works. I got one more quick story. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. It involves these little words. Okay. So it would be a Sunday night, and around 9 o'clock, they, they, they started to wind down a little bit. There'd be maybe two or three tables left, and me and the other bus boy, we would be like, you know, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to get out there at a reasonable hour. I have homework to do, and uh, we'd be standing around, and it was either Angel, it was either you, or Dolores, or Dolores, or Dolores, or Dolores. Yeah, probably, probably you. And me and the other bus boy would be like, oh, we've got two more tables, and we're out of here. Next thing you know, the door would open, and, a, and three or four, five, six people would come in, a crowd, and we'd be like, we'd be there. No, 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 please, no, please, no, please, no. And every once in a while, you'd see the doors, and they'd escort them out. But, but every once in a great while, they'd be like, come on, and we're like, oh, crap. Because <laughs> we, knew, we knew once they came in at 9 o'clock, they were good till, uh, till, till, till yeah, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. But honestly, there's, if you've never been there, if you didn't have the, 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 the privilege to go there, I feel bad for you because, uh, honestly, and I was thinking about this while you were talking, Angela. Two words come to mind: dignity and class. I mean, really, it was. It could have been. It could have been mid Midtown Manhattan. It could have been some real nice restaurant in South Philadelphia. But uh, my memories there. It wasn't. It wasn't long, but they were so. Uh, they were so great that uh, I didn't mean to suck up too much time. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Every <laughs> 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 No, unless Dolores has anything to say. We're almost out of time. <laughs> We're almost out of time. Okay.
your mother. Uh, her family lived next door to my house, right. so I've known her. I knew her since um, right. I was born, practically. There, there really wasn't a dress code at the chateau, but it was amazing how dressed up people came. That was the era, though, when we were wearing long skirts and everything anyway, you know. But that's the way people showed up there. It was, it was really kind of neat. Right. So, do you have any last, last thing? You got about a minute on the phone. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> and if you're ready. Yep. Okay.